Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to the second part of our two-part series focusing on stories similar to the Elise Matsunaga case. If you haven't seen part one, be sure to check that out first. We'll leave a link in the description below. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. With that out of the way, here is part two of two terrifying cases similar to the Elise Matsunaga story. At approximately 5.30 a.m. on the morning of November 5th, 1989, 41-year-old Betty Broderick showed up at a residence in the neighborhood of Marston Hills in San Diego, California. The home belonged to her ex-husband Daniel and his new wife Linda, who were lying asleep inside. The couple was blissfully unaware of Betty's presence as she entered the house, nor could they have known that she had brought a revolver with her that morning, a weapon that she had every intention of using. As she walked into the couple's bedroom and her eyes struggled to adjust to the darkness, she had only one thing on her mind as she prepared to squeeze the trigger. Revenge. Then, she fired five shots. Just a few years earlier, this situation would have been unthinkable to anyone that knew Betty and Daniel Broderick. Prior to the beginning of their divorce proceedings in 1985, they appeared to be the definition of an American success story. A happily married couple with four healthy children, who had managed to break through into local high society in San Diego. They were well known in the area's legal community thanks to Daniel's work as a high-powered malpractice attorney, and were regular guests at trendy parties. The couple had worked hard for their success as well. They had first met in 1965, while Betty was visiting the University of Notre Dame for a football weekend with her friend. Daniel was a senior at the school, studying to become a doctor, the eldest of nine children from an Irish Catholic family, and the first to attend college. He was instantly attracted to Betty, keeping in contact and romantically pursuing her until she finally agreed to date him a year later. Though Betty came from a slightly more well-off family, her parents were also strict and religious people, who expected a lot from her. She went to Catholic girls' schools growing up and attended college, earning a degree in early childhood education in New York. Betty and Daniel were married in April of 1969, and just a year later, their first daughter was born. The next few years were tough, but seemed to be ultimately worthwhile. After finishing his MD at Cornell, Daniel was accepted and decided to attend Harvard Law School. During that time, Betty totally supported the decision, working to support the family and take care of their growing children as Daniel finished school. After his graduation, Daniel was immediately hired by a law firm, where he quickly became a rising star. By the time the Broderick's fourth child was born, they were living an extremely comfortable life in La Jolla, and Daniel was running his own legal practice. In addition to Daniel and Betty's newfound social clout, their rapidly improving financial situation allowed them to buy numerous cars, go on lavish vacations, join expensive country clubs, and send their children to prestigious private schools. However, looks could be deceiving. Within the Broderick home, neither Daniel nor Betty were happy in their marriage. Betty felt trapped and unappreciated, isolated from her family and feeling that her husband took no responsibility for their children. She said that she was simply expected to stay home and cook and clean, and began to lash out at both Daniel and the children. Daniel, for his part, was emotionally distant, spending less and less time at home and becoming increasingly unresponsive to Betty's constant threats of divorce. Still, however rocky, the marriage continued on for several years, until things took a turn, beginning in 1983. That was the year that Daniel met a woman named Linda Colkenna. Linda was a 22-year-old former flight attendant who immediately caught Daniel's eye when she began working as a receptionist on his floor at work. Soon after meeting, Daniel hired Linda as his personal assistant. Though Betty was originally pleased to hear that her husband had hired someone to help him out at the office, believing it would allow him to spend more time at home, it didn't take long for her to grow suspicious of Daniel and Linda's relationship. Though Daniel denied that anything was going on between them, 
This did nothing to alleviate Betty's concerns, and things began to grow even worse between them. Things finally went off a cliff in February of 1985, when Daniel moved out, saying that he was unhappy in the marriage. At this time, the family had temporarily moved into a rental property while work was being done on their residence in La Jolla. So when Daniel moved out, he was actually just moving back into the house where they had formerly lived. Betty took this as a sign that he was trying to steal the house from her and began to retaliate. First, she began to drop the children off with her husband one by one on the doorstep of the home. She later claimed that this was done both in an attempt to save the marriage by reuniting Daniel with his family, but also conversely so that he would get a taste of how difficult parenting could be. A more aggressive incident followed in June of that year when Betty broke into the La Jolla residence, trashed her husband's bedroom, shattered mirrors, and spray-painted curtains, walls, and a brick fireplace. In September, Daniel filed for divorce. The proceedings would drag out for the next four years, all the while incidents between the Brodericks kept escalating. At the same time, Daniel began openly dating his assistant Linda. The two ultimately got married in April of 1989, just a short time after Daniel and Betty's divorce was finalized. The road leading up to that point was punctuated with more wild incidents, with Betty growing increasingly more violent and threatening towards Daniel and Linda and Daniel responding by seemingly punishing Betty using the legal system. Betty routinely left profane messages on Daniel and Linda's answering machine and ignored numerous restraining orders that forbid her from setting foot on their property. In one instance, she even drove her car into the front of Daniel's new home. In court documents, Daniel alleged that when he opened the car to pull Betty out, she reached for a large butcher's knife under the seat and had to be physically restrained until police could arrive. After that, she spent three days in a mental health hospital. For her part, Betty claimed that Daniel routinely used his knowledge and influence within the legal system to exact a similar kind of revenge. When their house in La Jolla was sold in 1986, Daniel was reportedly able to get the sale approved without Betty's signature, using a procedure that allowed a judge to sign over Betty's half of the property. This was apparently the incident that had prompted Betty to drive her car into Daniel's new home. Betty claimed that finding a qualified divorce attorney in San Diego was also nearly impossible, as by the time the proceedings took place, Daniel was the president of the San Diego Bar Association, and no one wanted to take a case opposing him, especially one this messy. Likewise, Betty alleged similar legal problems had resulted in Daniel getting full custody of their children leaving her with no visitation rights. Though Daniel denied all of these accusations, there was at least one circumstance where his more punitive side was confirmed. To get back at Betty, he began to institute a personal system of fines against her, deducting money from her alimony payments for behaviors he viewed as infractions. According to the LA Times, quote, Daniel began to withhold $100 for every obscene word she used, $250 for each time she set foot on his property, $500 for every entry into his house, and $1,000 for every time she took one of the children without his permission. In one month, these instances apparently happened so many times that Daniel reportedly told Betty that she owed him $1,300. However, a judge later put a stop to this, ordering Daniel to pay Betty $12,500 a month a sum that was later increased to $16,100. Though Daniel and Betty's divorce was officially settled in early 1989, the problems between them were far from over. Linda was reportedly so worried that Betty was going to show up at their wedding in April of that year that she asked Daniel to wear a bulletproof vest. He refused, and the ceremony ended up going smoothly. However, shortly after the wedding, Betty was as persistent as ever in both her threats against Daniel and Linda and her insistence that she in turn was being threatened and harassed. She claimed that Linda sent her ads for facial cream and weight loss treatments in the mail, along with a picture of her and Daniel. Whether this was the last straw in Betty's mind is uncertain, but what we do know is that by the fateful morning of November 5th, 1989, she was ready to settle things once and for all. Using a key to Daniel and Linda's home she had stolen from one of her daughters, she entered, walked into their room, 
and fired five shots. While two of the bullets hit objects in the room, three others found their desired targets. Linda was struck in the head and the chest and killed instantly. Daniel was struck in the chest and bled out over several minutes. It would later be alleged that after realizing that Daniel was attempting to call for help, Betty calmly removed the phone and answering machine from the bedroom before leaving him to die. Betty turned herself into police not long after. At trial, Betty never denied firing the shots that had killed Daniel and Linda, but claimed that she had not gone over there with the intention of committing the murders. Her defense attorney argued that she exhibited symptoms of battered woman syndrome, a condition experienced by some who have suffered persistent psychological or physical abuse at the hands of intimate partners, leading them to believe that their only recourse is to murder their abuser. The prosecution, meanwhile, argued that Betty's well-documented history of actions leading up to the murders showed that they had been premeditated and that she was not actually suffering from a psychological condition. The trial ended with a hung jury, as two members held out for manslaughter, believing there was a lack of proven intent. A second trial in late 1991 saw almost identical arguments presented by both sides, but this time, it ended with Betty being convicted of two counts of second-degree murder, as well as illegal use of a firearm. She was sentenced to two consecutive terms of 15 years to life for the murders, as well as an additional two years for the weapons charge. Since her incarceration, Betty has requested and been denied parole numerous times. Her first request was denied in January of 2010, reportedly because she did not show remorse or acknowledge any wrongdoing. Subsequent unsuccessful attempts followed in November of 2011 and January of 2017. She will not be eligible again until January of 2032, at the age of 84. That brings us to the end of our list. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.